Hello and welcome to Sacred Psychology, the podcast for misfits and mystics. Here, neuroscience and spirituality go hand in hand. Join me, Tamara Powell, on a no holds barred adventure outside the box, because that's where all the truly great shit happens anyway. Welcome back to Sacred Psychology. I'm your host, Tamara Powell. Today's podcast is a really special one. I sat down with Reverend Stephanie Clark, who is a recovering non-denominational metaphysical reverend who likes to walk a little on the wild side of God, she says. The title of her autobiography, recently released on Amazon, says it all, The Misadventures of an Irreverent Reverend, A Spirited Guide for Rebels and Renegades. Born in London, England, Stephanie visited her mother in South Africa in 1986, where she had a vision of creating a multiracial ministry to heal the wounds of apartheid. She completed her ministerial studies at Agape in Los Angeles. If that sounds familiar, it should. Her teacher there was Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith of The Secret Fame. You've heard Alexander Cavucci and I gush about him plenty on previous conversations. In 2000, Reverend Steph founded the metaphysical ministry Soul Home in Johannesburg, South Africa, and led it successfully until 2005 when she handed it over to three top students. After 10 years away in Europe and Japan, Reverend Steph returned to South Africa in 2015 to take care of her elderly parents. She still speaks at Soul Home once or twice a month, but she's branched out as a speaker, author, and life coach, desiring to carry the message of spiritual truth and personal fulfillment beyond the walls of church. God and Sex was the provocative title of Reverend Steph's talk at the New Thought Conference in Johannesburg in August 2017, called Birthing the Divine Feminine from History to Her Story, with keynote speakers Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith and Lisa Nichols, who you also know from The Secret. Reverend Steph has written two books already, Down Dirty and Divine, A Spiritual Ride Through London's Underground, and her autobiography. She is currently writing her third book on God and Sex, with the working title, The Irreverent Reverend Rides Again. Cheeky, huh? Her fourth book on the cult of Isis in Roman Europe is also in utero. In addition to speaking and writing and demythologizing sex and sin, Reverend Steph also facilitates non-denominational sacred ceremonies and spiritual journeys to sacred sites such as the Egyptian pyramids. She's a psychic medium and a reader of the Akashic Records. And oh my word, she is a dear, sweet soul that I simply cannot get enough of. Stephanie was so generous with her time during today's conversation. She actually opens up our conversation with a sweet blessing, something brand new for this podcast, but one I could definitely get used to. She's a special gift for listeners, so please take a moment and check out the show notes after you're done listening to this incredible conversation. I don't want to keep you any longer, so without further ado, here is my conversation with the incredible Reverend Stephanie Clark. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on this show. It's a deep honor for me. Oh, it's an honor for me too. Thank you for asking me. Mm. So you have a lovely way of opening conversations, and I would love to dive right in. Okay. I'd like to do an affirmative prayer for for us and for the listeners before we get started. And I just want to say one thing. I'm so frightened that I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, (laughs) because I've been calling you Tamara in my head ever since we connect. (laughs) Tamara works, but it's Tamara. Mm -hmm. Tamara, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll try and get it the American way. (laughs) All good. <laughs> so let's pray. So suggest uh, to the people listening that, well, I guess you're in a quiet place already, but uh, it's a good idea to sit with both feet flat on the ground and your spine straight and allow your breathing channels to work in the optimum way. And um, some people close their eyes, some people don't, whatever's comfortable for you. <sighs> so we're just turning aside right now from the past, everything that was going on before this particular moment in time. Turning aside also from all experiences of previous interviews or podcasts, whether we've been participants or listeners, just turning aside entirely from our history and also turning aside from the future and any anticipation about what this podcast may hold. Turning aside from any future thoughts beyond this podcast 
bringing ourselves fully and completely into this now moment, aware that this is the only time that there is, and there is only one power, one presence, one life, one spirit, and some people choose to call that God. And I know that I am a beloved daughter of this mother, father, creative presence, and so too is Tamara, and so too is everyone who is listening to this podcast. We are all united as one. We are all part of the same sacred presence. And I speak my word for this interview this day and know that spirit has gone ahead to prepare the way. The spirit knows exactly what has to be said, what has to be heard, what has to be healed and what has to be revealed. And I know that Tamara and I are perfectly prepared instruments to allow the divine sway to take over here and for each of us to be clear, clean, articulate instruments of the spirit so that everything that needs to be said is said in a way that can be perfectly understood and integrated by everyone who is a part of this interview. So I bless this time together. I name it good, good, and very good. I know it is a time of awakening. It's a time of inspiration. It's a time of learning and deepening and it's infused with the presence of joy and love. Tamara and I are in holy connection with one another and in holy connection with all of the listeners. And this holy connection is the very foundation of love that guides, governs, and directs our beings. So I bless this interview. I bless this time. I know that the ripple effect is endless. It's forever. And it's only good for everyone who is in any way involved. So I do give thanks and I release my word now into law and I allow it to be. And so it is. Amen. Amen. Oh, what a lovely, beautiful, thoughtful way of opening our conversation. Thank you for that gift. Mm, thank you. Mm. So Reverend Stephanie, or Reverend Steph, as you go by, you mm -hmm. describe yourself as a recovering non-denominational metaphysical reverend who likes to walk a little on the wild side of God. I mm -hmm. love that. <laughs> <laughs> you and I could be soul sisters with that. There's so much synchronicity between our stories. Between it multi is, yes, yeah, we too. Yeah, it's like we were meant to meet. We had to meet. Yep. <laughs> totally. Between the multicultural awareness and that omnist agape style love, as well as the embracing of spiritual and psychic giftings, I'm just in awe of your story. Thank you. So for those who haven't yet had the pleasure of reading your autobiography, which I highly recommend, by the way, and I will have a link to that in the show notes, which, Thank you. yes, definitely, you, you call it the misadventures of an irreverent reverend, oh, a spirited guide for rebels and renegades. Can you give us a brief overview of how a working class girl from London came to be a globe trotting new thought leader? <laughs> wow, when you put it like that, it's quite a journey. Yes. Uh, um, well, let's get something straight here. I wasn't entirely working class. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this is the images that leapt off the page from my uh, American uh, naive ways. <laughs> That's okay. It's just class matters to a Brit, and I wish it didn't matter, but it matters. No, my, my parents were working class, that's for sure. But in the mm. course of my lifetime, we, we elevated ourselves in the society. We became middle class. We lived in a middle class neighborhood. Oh, see, here's where I think semantics and language is so powerful, too, because here in the States, that is our middle class. Oh, working class is the middle class. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, interesting. So, interesting side note. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Okay, we could probably go down that track too, but we won't. Yeah, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about your globetrotting ways from yeah. the UK to yeah, working exactly. alongside Michael Beckwith and Lisa Nichols. Mm -hmm. Well, so yeah, I never really liked my childhood. I never liked growing up in England and I didn't like my family. And my family was a classic dysfunctional family is classic design. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, but I have heard in the rooms of um, the 12-step program that maybe my family was dis dysfunctional because I was in it. <laughs> 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 well, that's cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. so um, I, as soon as I could, I, I began studying languages. I think we started at age 11 in school. 
and I loved foreign languages and I just it just planted a seed in me that that what I wanted to do was travel and get out of England and experience life in a in a much broader way than than I was raised to experience it and my mother um, and father both encouraged me to travel in fact my mother said Stephanie when you're older, I don't want you to get married right away. I want you to see the world before you get married. So I haven't seen the world yet, and I haven't got married. <laughs> <laughs> In that, I was obedient, which is quite rare for me. Anyway, yeah, so I went to university, and I, I got to study in Germany for six months and also in Russia for four months when it was still behind the Iron Curtain during the communist era. So that was really, really exciting. And there's a chapter in my book about getting arrested by the KGB. I don't know if you got that. I loved that story. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What I most felt was for your poor friend that you didn't get to say goodbye to. Yeah, that was so sad. That was so sad. Mm. Never never caught up with him after that. Mm. Yeah, so as soon as I could, really, as soon as I was 18, went to Switzerland. From Switzerland, I met a girl and went to Amsterdam with her, and I loved Amsterdam. I loved trying to be a hippie and just that freedom, that that amazing lifestyle of freedom in Amsterdam that I encountered that I had never experienced in England. It was such a a free-thinking society, and I I really related to that. I love the way you write about, well, everything, but when I was reading that chapter, I kept getting um, hooked on the mismatched socks versus <laughs> having your shit together and having matched socks. <laughs> I thought, what a great way. I have a daughter who's now 12, and I swear she purposefully finds mismatched socks in the bin to put on every uh-huh. day. I think it's a, an identity issue. <laughs> <laughs> so that is what I think of your time in Amsterdam. Mismatched socks and uh, free love was good. Mm. Uh, no, for the readers, I should explain that I, I worked at McDonald's in Amsterdam and I, one of my friends there was a hippie and she um, invited me to come and stay with her for a while in her, in her squat. Mm-hmm. And um, she, she wore socks that didn't match and I thought that was just the pinnacle of coolness. <laughs> <laughs> and I think here we are some, you know, several decades later, that's still the pinnacle of coolness in the subgrouping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, so Amsterdam, then I went to university in, so, oh, I talked about that already mm-hmm. at university, then I studied in Germany and I studied in Russia. But when university finished, I didn't have a clue about my future. I didn't know where I was going to go. And I knew I wasn't suited to middle management, which is where most of my fellow students were headed. They just wanted a good, again, that word middle class job yep. that would give them a good income where they could use their foreign languages that they'd been studying. And while people were going to careers lectures on a Wednesday afternoon, I was in the feminist group and I was demonstrating against pornography. So Which was one of my questions for you, because I really want to divide, dive into the divine feminine. So I'm so sorry for pausing you there, but how, how did you get into this, you know, movement against porn? I'm just fascinated by that because there's still, as you know, such a dichotomy among feminism. Is it sexually empowering or is it, you know, another form of patriarchal misogyny? And so mm-hmm. I just am, would love to pick your brain there for a hot little rabbit trail of where did you find yourself on that line, having read oh. The Female Eunuch? Yeah, no, the female unit was the, the huge catalyst. In fact, I just saw Jermaine Greer on TV last night. And oh, wow, what synchronicity. Woman. Yeah, mm. I had the chance to meet her as well. She came to lecture in Canterbury where I was living in England and I got to be in her lecture and then also address her from the, from the crowd. So that was so special. She's, wow. She was so important to me in my journey. Just, you know, took the blinkers off completely about how I'd been raised in such a, a sexist culture and not even known it, but known that something was wrong. Right. So with uh, pornography, to me, it is, it is misogynist. It's based on, for me, the man's right or entitlement to use and abuse a woman's body as his own property. Mm-hmm. So, and, uh, and it can be erotic. So I'm not, not saying that, that I'm completely impervious to it. I have watched porn and it can be erotic. Mm-hmm. It is erotic to watch, to watch lovemaking. It's a very strong visual erotic image. However, uh, where, where porn comes from most of the time is from this uh, misogynistic standpoint. So that's why I don't really want to ever support it. Yeah, so 
I'm curious then, what do you think of the, you know, third and fourth wave feminists now who are attempting to reclaim it and have started their own porn media companies and are doing quote unquote feminist porn? Do you think there's a place in the sexual empowerment of a, of a woman or are we just internalizing patriarchy in some way? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Right? Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, honestly, I haven't thought this through before this moment, so it's really no worries. Something. Off the cuff, <laughs> yeah. yeah, off the cuff is good. So, I have seen porn that is clearly about pleasing the woman as opposed to the man getting mm-hmm. his, and that's beautiful. That's beautiful porn for me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the women who are wanting to reclaim that area of media and create pornography that's pleasing to women or erotic for women without the the hatred going on underneath. I think that's a beautiful creative expression, honestly. I think that's a a wonderful thing to develop. And at the same time, I'm still questioning, is there something going on there about, um, which is, which we've inherited from that patriarchal culture and the deep roots that the biblical bias against women has imbued within us, you know, the, 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 the desire to be a good daughter of the patriarchy that has mm-hmm. us in ways that would, the men would approve of. Like, I can imagine a man really approving of lesbian porn or porn created by women. It's like watching two lesbians making love, right? It's like I erotic. was just going to say that, yep. <laughs> so, uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Yes. It's always about where it's coming from rather than what the actual result is or what the, like, What's the the intent? The, the, yeah, the intent, the motivation behind creating that porn. Is it to uplift, to expand, to generate love and generate sensuality, or is it about making money and about yeah consumerism? Where's the, what's you know what's the uh, original intent behind it? Oh, I just love the way that you wrestle with it. So. Mm. To get back to your story, here you are then in the late 70s and you write in your book that you'd become a socialist feminist and with dreams of bringing down the patriarchal British empire. And I love this line. You say, finally, I had a label and an identity to be reckoned with, or so I thought. I did not know then that to simply rebel against the status quo is a position of powerlessness. Victims are never victors. Oh, girl, (laughs) (laughs) the existentialist mystic in me just swooned so hard. (laughs) You are so good for an author's soul, my dear. (laughs) (laughs) Well, buckle up, Buttercup, because I have so much more I want to ask you about then. That, you know, from a new thought perspective, then this idea, I'm sure you're no stranger to even American politics right now. And we've got a huge, you know, upheaval going on in our, mm. Ugh, mm. Yeah, I won't even dive into, but this notion of pushing against energy is still giving energy to something just mm-hmm. fascinates me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can you describe a little more about now, you know, fast forward, here we are 30 years later and you're this uh, reverend and, you know, uh, new thought, law of attraction with other people, giving it in the most basic terms. What mm-hmm. has been your experience with that of, you know, victims are never victors and rebelling against the status quo is still a position of powerlessness? Mm-hmm. So at the time, if I cast my mind back, I remember... I just, I felt like a victim in general. I didn't know then at age, I guess I was 23, 24 at the time that I didn't know then that what I know now, which is in, in the new thought teaching that I, I am the cause of my reality. So I'm mm-hmm. the cause of my environment, the people who come into my world and my feelings, my experiences. I just felt like um, I was a victim of outer authorities, including God, by the way, but my parents, for sure, yes. the academic world, for sure, men, for sure, money. Um, there were many things that I had, without consciously knowing it, given my power to and felt then dominated by. Mm-hmm. I wasn't ever aware of giving my power away to those things, but, but I had without knowing it. So now, having been through uh, years of training in the New Thought world, I do understand that... Um, 
if I fight something, I just make it stronger in my experience. And what am I really fighting? It's, I'm actually fighting a concept. Mm-hmm. I'm fighting a system. I'm fighting my concept of a system, <laughs> which in a way is freeing to know that. Because if I, if I know that what I'm fighting are actually thoughts in my own head, then that's where I have some power to change. But if yes. I'm trying to bring down a system, whether I'm trying to do it on my own or whether I'm um, g- uh, going into agreement with a group of people who also want to bring down a certain system, we're still, we're still powerless because we're fighting something outside of ourselves and the cause of the conflict is within, always. So. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, I got my, my pom-poms out here cheering because... <laughs> high school cheerleader. I just, I love that because self-empowerment, that's the only place to start. And I, I really love the concept in there of, you know, promoting what you love rather than pushing against something that you hate. Yeah, exactly. I was going to move to that. I was going to say that um, I still would get behind anyone who's advocating social change. Um, Mm -hmm. But the way to move forward is, through the vision, like, like, what is it that I want? Like, if I'm, I'm seeing stuff here in my world that I don't want and I don't like and I don't agree with, but what do I want really? Because the universe always moves in the direction of my attention. So if my attention is what I don't want, then I just create more of that. I reinforce that every time I think about it. But if I'm thinking about what I do want, the universe has a chance to conspire around my vision and my my. You know, my divine outcome that I would want from a certain situation. Which brings me to your time in South Africa then after college and some mm. of the, I love the way that you, you gently poke fun at yourself in your writing where you, mm-hmm. you use yourself as, like you don't take yourself too seriously, which I think is such a wonderful, <laughs> very empowered stance to take. And thinking about how, you know, you wanting to work against apartheid and Spirit very cleverly bringing you around to teaching English rather than fighting the man in the streets, so to speak. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Can you share a little bit with our readers how you ended up in South Africa and really that visioning process for you that Michael mm-hmm. Beckwith would talk about? Yeah, no, that was very important. That did come quite a bit later, but um, mm-hmm. now that, yeah, to talk about that whole story of getting to South Africa. So I didn't. I didn't ever want to go to South Africa. At the time, it was under apartheid. And sure, most of your listeners are old enough to know that it was a legalized system of oppression of the white people over the black people, mm-hmm. where it was written into the law that the black people are second-class citizens and don't have the same rights as white people. So in America, it was never written into the law. Uh, and in South Africa, it was. And that's the difference between racism in America and apartheid in South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mother uh, had um, gone to visit her sister a number of times who was working in South Africa and she loved it and decided to emigrate. And I, I had a bad relationship with my mum well, until I was 44, which is when I emerged out of teenagerhood. <laughs> <laughs> you had a delayed adolescence, huh, girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> I had so much rebelling to do. I couldn't get it all done before I was 20. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> So my mother had emigrated and I was living in a, in a squat in Amsterdam with a gangster and she wanted to, she wanted to see me. So she said, I'll, I'll come and see you in Amsterdam or else if you want to come to South Africa, you can come here. So I thought, hmm, choices, choices. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm going to South Africa and I really didn't want to go. I didn't want to add my white face to the oppressive regime. I just mm-hmm. thought by going there, I'm even supporting the regime and I didn't want to do that. But um, when I got there, yeah, so the first night that we had a really bad thunderstorm in, in Johannesburg, and I went to meditate because I had a really bad headache from the pressure in the atmosphere. And um, while I was meditating, I heard the inner voice say, I've prepared you, and now I've brought you here to do the work. And I mean, I'd gone to South Africa for two months. I thought, mm-hmm. well, I'm going to see my mom. I'm going to travel a bit. I'm not gonna ever live I didn't even consider living there but then this spiritual imperative was quite powerful and I I took notes and I and I opened up and then I found the church of religious science where I began my science of mind teach uh, studies and this was the the new thought church in in Johannesburg that I joined and it was the minister there who really helped me 
because she knew that I wanted to bring down the system and she didn't want me to end up in jail or, or dead, which you could see <laughs> happening very, very easily if I continued down that track. So she said to me, uh, create a vision of what you want to see happening in South Africa and then decide what your role can be in fulfilling that vision. And then the third point is, what can you do in the next 24 hours that will move you forward in the fulfillment of your own your own uh, part in that in that vision fulfilling itself mm -hmm. so my vision was to have black and white people sharing government equally and speaking english so speaking the international language of government and my role was going to be teaching black students how to read and speak and write english and then the, what could i do in the next 24 hours well i never got that far so i put that <laughs> off for about two years <laughs> <laughs> like so many of us thanks for the vision spirit and i'm putting this back on the shelf yeah no just procrastination rules mm -hmm. so um but then i i went to europe for a holiday and i saw the movie cry freedom and that was about um the black civil rights activist steve biko mm -hmm. and how he had in his own way you know tried to to communicate with donald woods the white journalist and been able to successfully helped Donald Woods understand the plight of the black people in South Africa. So Donald Woods was also then wanted by the white um, South African police. And the movie is the story of how Donald Woods uh, befriended Biko and then escaped from the South African authorities. So the movie was just such a catalyst for me because I realized, oh gosh, you know, I've, I've become numb. I've, I've been living in South Africa and I've become numb to this awful situation. It's become normal for me to mm -hmm. see people struggling and hungry and in poverty and unemployed and uh, um, anyway, so the movie kicked butt and I went back to South Africa and then I started uh, teaching English as a volunteer. And now we have a, a mixed race government and the language is English, which is amazing really. And so a lot of Africans are not happy about it because they would prefer to speak in Af the African languages in the government. But mm -hmm. At this point, it is the language of English, and I, I think there's definite merit in that if South Africa wants to be a world power. For sure. Yeah. What I love most about that story, though, is that concept of, okay, number one, giving yourself over to a higher calling, to your calling, your soul's vision for this incarnation, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Mm -hmm finding a way to promote what you love and giving to students, teaching them English, giving that gives them an opportunity or gave them an opportunity to rise up out of poverty because it opened doors to higher education, which opened doors to better employment. So mm -hmm. here you were working on apartheid without actually having to go out and get you know, <laughs> imprisoned as your mentor was so afraid of. Exactly. Yeah. And that, yeah. But that requires that, you know, sitting still process and being mindful and, you know, visioning. And, and I just, I'm hoping that today's podcast, if it doesn't plant anything else, plants a seed for that, you know, spend some time getting still and asking. You, uh, I don't have it in front of me at the second, but you talk about in your book in such a beautiful way. I also grew up in Protestant, well, here in America, we evangelical Christianity and mm -hmm heard those passages. I can quote the Bible better than most pastors. I like to joke because I went to all Christian schools and we were in church whenever the doors were open, girl. So mm. you present in your book ways of new ways of looking at the Bible and the passage that you speak on of asking, seeking and knocking just blew my mind. Can you describe for our listeners? What I loved was the persistence in your voice. When you speak, you, you basically tell the reader to get vehement and, and don't, don't let up until you get your answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been, I think, in traditional Christian um, ways of teaching, we've been scared to demand of God, you know, like mm -hmm. demand. Like, Especially women. Yeah, women, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because women don't God, demand anything. Yeah, 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 exactly. We try to take care of other people's needs the, rather than demand anything from or ask, even ask, or even request. <laughs> request. Yeah, good point, good point. <laughs> in business, in the bedroom, anywhere, we don't, we don't feel like we have a right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, I've, what I learned in the Science of Mind teaching is that rather than, there's a whole different way of perceiving God, so rather than an outer power, external power, 
specifically not a male power. It's, a, it's the power within. So if I'm speaking the truth about myself and I'm not getting the manifestation, I can demand, hey, you know, <laughs> I'm speaking this, I demand that my good shows up right now or I demand that I have clarity right now. Mm-hmm. Why can't I do that? I'm not, demand, I'm not being a cheeky person with um, a punishing authority. I'm demanding from the law of this universe that I get my, my result that I'm looking for. Ooh, I love that. I've often talked about with my clients how our, our psyches and our, our bodies will do the same thing. Our symptoms, as we like to call them, are kind of like the UPS driver here in the United States, the package, the mailman, delivery guy showing up at the door, knocking, <laughs> saying, I have a message for you. And mm. if you, you have every right to ignore it, but eventually it's going to keep getting louder and louder and they might even knock down your door (laughs) and unfortunately that's when a lot of people you know either their marriages are are broken or their bodies start breaking down we start seeing cancers ulcers it's literally your higher self trying to get that message across and so i love the reverse reframe of that of we can go to spirit source god goddess whatever your terminology is for our listener Mm -hmm. And do the same thing of like, I'm not letting go. I think about the, you know, some of the stories in the Bible, you know, with the Christ of people <laughs> getting really quite vehement with him as, as well. I'm not letting go of you until you heal me. Mm-hmm. What you're saying, though, is that it works for our, our life vision, our life path and things that we want to manifest as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like being ballsy with God. <laughs> <laughs> Which does feel very irreverent. I'm so glad you wrote this book. <laughs> so if I may bring this around to you going and studying at the Agape Center and deciding to become a minister, can you talk to us about realizing your life calling and as now, you know, a woman who's wakening the divine feminine across the planet. Mm-hmm. Um, so you want to hear about the, the actual call? Yes, the call yeah. and then how you chose to fulfill that. Okay. So, yeah, so I, was, I was living in Johannesburg and I was going to my science of mind classes and I really loved, uh, loved church and I never thought of myself growing up as a person who would love church. I wasn't raised in a religious background, unlike you. I, mm-hmm. I, was, I was raised in a Northern European Christian culture, but that, you know, I sure. never really had to go to church. And I, I was working as a secretary and I was so frustrated, just knew that this it wasn't right for me, that this could not be my life forever. And I asked one of the girls in my class to do prayer work for me to know my purpose. Oh, yeah, I was constipated as well. So, um, <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, the en- just knew the energy was not flowing through me. Mm-hmm. And that's what, why the f- uh, physical manifestation of that was showing up as constipation. Yeah, that um, solar plexus and sacral chakra was blocked. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, anyway, so the girl uh, in my class started doing... We call it treatment. It was what I did at the beginning of our interview. We call it um, a science of mind treatment or a prayer Mm. treatment. And it's because we're not praying to an outer God. We're treating our own mind so that we can tune into the truth, which is is something that we're not attuned to when we're experiencing problems or difficulties. So as soon as we tune into the truth and there's a a, a sense of a, a oneness or a connection with our higher self, then usually the answers start to manifest. Anyway, so she, she was a really good prayer worker. And very quickly after she started praying for me, I heard my inner voice say, um, go to California and study for the ministry. And I knew about this uh, ministerial training school because my teacher, Gladys, Reverend Gladys, had told us about her experience in America doing her ministerial training. And I knew that, that, that I wanted it, but I was still so terrified. I was Mm-hmm. really mature and I was drinking and drugging and sleeping around I was promiscuous you know so it didn't like I wasn't exactly your your poster child for the ministry <laughs> <laughs> you're a bit of a Jezebel <laughs> <laughs> I take that as a compliment now <laughs> I do too now but yes but there was stigma attached to it back in the day definitely yeah so I I decided that I would do it. I was, um, at the time I was 30 and I realized if I didn't do it then, I probably would never do it. I, I knew that I, I, I would have to 
take this big leap before I ended up married or with kids or you know, in that kind of, in a settled life. Not sure. that I've ever really settled, but at mm-hmm. that time there was still a chance I might have had kids and I might have settled. So I, yeah, I, I, I booked my passage to America and um, I started out at an international uh, metaphysical training school, but not with Reverend Michael. I didn't know about Reverend Michael at the time when I left for America, um, but I had met the the woman, the minister who had founded this ministerial school. It was in Santa Anita in Arcadia, near Pasadena. So I met her in South Africa and she'd interviewed me and she gave me a place at her school. So I went there and while I was there, people in my class told me about Reverend Michael because I had talked about my vision of having a multiracial ministry in South Africa and they knew that Reverend Michael was a, the up-and-coming you know, African-American preacher with a wonderful multiracial community in, in Santa Monica. So they recommended that I go and meet him. And I, as soon as I did, I, I never wanted to go back. I, I <laughs> remember my this, well, if anyone's heard him, they'll know just he's the most dynamic speaker I've ever heard. And mm-hmm. he has such a capacity to break open the walls and like just break through the density in consciousness and allow people to see, feel, perceive, hear, know the spirit in ways that the Bible and the Christian teaching has never been able to accomplish. Not for me anyway. So no, it just transcends. Yeah. It just transcends all of the Absolutely, limitations. Yeah. I agree. Mm. So I wasn't studying at, at Agape at that point. I was still finishing my ministerial training at Santa Anita, but that was for three years. And I, I finished that training and I knew that I wasn't emotionally mature enough to come back to South Africa and start a multiracial ministry. I knew I needed more time in America. I, I needed more time to grow up. Um, I also had to get sober. And I didn't know that at the time either. But um, in I think 1992, I graduated as a minister. Oh, that's right. And Reverend Michael was the keynote speaker at my graduation ceremony. Mm. And I stood up in the pulpit at, on the day of my ceremony and I talked about my vision for South Africa. And Reverend Michael came up to me afterwards and said, I have a group at Agape who are preparing a trip for me to South Africa. And it would be wonderful if you, if you would like to join that group and I'll put you in touch with the woman who's running it. So I joined the, the South Africa Vision Group at Agape, and we prepared for Ever Michael to, to go to South Africa and preach the word, and I think he eventually went in 1993. Now, what's really interesting that's not in the book, because this hadn't happened when I published the book, but so I couldn't go in 1993. I didn't have my, my green card, I didn't have a visa. If I had left for South Africa with Reverend Michael on that trip, which I badly wanted to do. But if I had, I wouldn't have been able to get back into the USA. Oh, wow. and I knew it wasn't time for me to leave the USA. So I decided I should rather stay there. And, and uh, Reverend Michael went with a, with a small group from, a, from Agape. Mm-hmm. And he went into Soweto, the black township outside Johannesburg. And he went to the major, the major centers in South Africa. There were only at that point, I think, three or four metaphysical churches and they were run by white people. So he connected with uh, the, or a couple of uh, metaphysical practitioners in Johannesburg. He connected with them and he, that was his, um, his opening to, to preach in, in the black townships as well, which is fantastic that he was able to do that. So yeah, in March this year, uh, one of my congregants here in South Africa came up to me and told me that he had invited Reverend Michael to come to South Africa and speak in August at the Divine Feminine Conference. Mm -hmm. And I had just delivered my third talk on God and sex, and he asked me to do that talk when Reverend Michael came. So Reverend Michael came, and Lisa Nichols and uh, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson and his wife Gina, they all came from the USA, and it was the most amazing conference. And after the conference, the Reverend Michael and his his group from Agape, who had come with him, there were about 30 people from Agape. They went on safari, they went to Port Elizabeth, they went to Cape Town, and uh, my ticket was paid to accompany them. Uh, It wasn't my doing, but it got paid for. And I was sitting next to Reverend Michael on the plane as we were flying from Johannesburg to Port Elizabeth, which is what I had envisioned in 1992, that I would be with him on his trip to South Africa. 
Oh my goodness! And so when he went in 1993, I couldn't go with, and in in 19 in 2017, <laughs> all those years later, 24 years later, here I am. Still, the vision is still unfolding. Isn't that amazing? It, it is just phenomenal, and that's uh-huh. that's exciting. That's the way it works. It's beautiful to see, and it's beautiful to be alive long enough to see these things unfolding and and coming full circle. You know, those things you can't foretell when you're when you're in your 30s and 40s but when you get to your 50s well that's my experience anyway. <laughs> in my 50s that things are starting to complete themselves in the most beautiful way and it's really lovely to, to see it and to see everything falling into place what an epic moment that conference on birthing the divine feminine from history to her story mm-hmm. i just i'm in awe sometimes that i'm even alive to be able to witness this awakening globally Mm-hmm. And judging by the audience's reaction, because I watched, you know, the video of your ch- your talk there, you were mm-hmm. stirring the pot and waking some souls up. <laughs> it was exciting to see all the laughter and shocked faces. <laughs> <laughs> it really reminds me of some of the classes that I teach at the University of West Florida and, you know, mentioning female masturbation or, you know, other uh-huh. things especially and then relating it back to religiosity and there's oh did she just say that it's, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's it was really cool and that brings me to what I am most wanted there's so many things in your book I keep saying that everyone needs to go read the book but um that I want to talk about is the idea of there not being you know, strong female archetypes in our spirituality, especially in Western culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what jumped out at me is on page 34 of your book, you say there were no female religious role models in my early life, only the saints like Joan of Arc, who, because of their outspoken faith, got themselves tortured by the kings and the bald men in long dresses. Then there were the nuns who had to shave their heads to make themselves sexless and get married to a God whom they could not see or touch or hold. And why did they have to shave their heads if they were going to cover them up anyway with their weird, starchy, pointy headgear? There were certainly no female church leaders in middle-class Christian Surrey. They simply hadn't been invented then. No, women were simply vicar's wives, a tireless adjunct to their husbands, managing the affairs of home and church behind the scenes, while the glory went to God and husband. And Sundays, a sacred day of rest for most Christians, was the most hectic day of the week for the wives, dedicated to making tea and caring for the flock with no time off on Monday to recuperate. Vickers' wives were not sexy. Ladies who churched were frumpy, as if religious devotion required an agreement to shut down on feminine beauty, sexuality, and pleasure. God forbid they should be like the temptress Eve and cause the men in the parish to fall into sin. What sin? The sin of sex? No, I am referring to the traditional male sin of blaming the woman for their male erection and all activity that comes from it. <laughs> oh, drop the mic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so good. I just, I think I was in the carpool lane picking up my daughter when I read that. And I just was like, hell yes. <laughs> she, probably out loud. People around me were probably like, what is going on in that car? I was getting Pentecostal. Um, <laughs> so true. I mean, that was literally my upbringing. And I'm sure for most of the planet right now, there's this divide between being a whole woman and mm-hmm. being a spiritual woman. Mm-hmm. So can you talk for a moment about this unfortunate knockout combo be- about the missing and the misogynized and what this did to hundreds of years of the divine feminine manifesting in our history and daily lives? Well, oh, she's been cut out and cut and hurt and harmed and damaged and abused and (laughs) obliterated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, I've been doing a lot of research lately since I, since I gave my talk that you mentioned in in August at the divine feminine conference, I'm, I'm now, there was such a rush to buy the book when, when the talk was finished and there as yet I haven't written the book on God and sex, but I'm writing it now. (laughs) Um, It's called the irreverent reverend rides again which is a play on words. <laughs> I love it. I love it, love it, love it. <laughs> anyway, so, so in my research, what I've realized is that Genesis 
we think that Genesis is the beginning. That's how we've been taught to believe, isn't it? That in the mm-hmm. beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And we think that's the beginning of history. Well, it is the beginning of his story. But um, before, before Genesis was written, the goddess reigned supreme in the Middle East, in the Near East. And the Bible has been a deliberate, a deliberate attempt or a successful attempt to obliterate all reference to women. Yes. Goddess worship. And so she's been written out of our scriptures. And it's clear from Genesis that Adam was made in the image and likeness of God, and then woman was made in the image and likeness of Adam. So she's a step down from God. Mm-hmm. And she's been, it's, it's clear that she's a, a so-called his helper, but really his servant, and that if she doesn't like the way he treats her, she has to put up with it anyway because he's her husband. She must obey him. So Eve is, and women, womankind is set up as property, inferior and property. And whew, with that identity, I mean, what, what hope do we have? What chance do we have? So, well, the only hope is the divine feminine, that there's um, a reemergence of our awareness of ourselves as women, as, as divine beings created equal but different with men. So, and that we're not created out of God's side or the man's side. <laughs> we are the birth givers. We are the... Uh, I'm speaking to the converted here, I know. But yes. um, we are the, the ones who bring life to the planet, create life. So our, our entire being, our body, our, our ways of being, our intuitive selves, everything has been desecrated in favor of male power. But, you know, the time is over now. So it's clear that women's movement is on the rise. It's rising back, yes. Yeah, absolutely. And. I just love it that Meghan Markle just got engaged to Prince Harry. She's so powerful. She's a visionary. She's black. She's an actress. She's divorced. And she's, she's ticks. <laughs> I'm so pleased about that. <laughs> Ruffling and, uh, all the feathers. Yeah, <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> but we've got Hillary Clinton and I uh, read that the, the latest um, president of Iceland is a, is a woman who's into ecology and, a feminist. Mm-hmm. There's so many, so many pieces of evidence all around now that the divine feminine is, is having her way. So I'm just so delighted about that. And like you said earlier, just delighted to be born in this time and, and in a time where this is happening and which we could never have predicted a few years ago. Yes. And that women get to not only like you and myself who get to be educated and who get to serve in a ministerial or in a metaphysical or in any sacred way whatsoever is just such a mm-hmm. blessing. And yet yeah, our well, birthright that was taken away. So it's almost a reclaiming of. Yeah, that's how I feel. I always had this sense about being a priestess. And um, it's funny how you know, men are priest, men are called a priest and women are called priestesses. And priestesses has a very different understanding to it from uh, as opposed to a male Catholic priest, you know, when you hear the word mm-hmm. priestess, it's definite, it's got definite erotic connotations, spiritual as opposed to religious, and, and not as weighty, that's my sense of it anyway, it's not quite as weighty as a male priest. You know? No, and it often but isn't when the erotic's attached to it, I think. That's, that's true too, yeah, because our bodies have been, and our mm-hmm. erotic natures have been desecrated. Oh. Yeah, in college I did some research on... Uh, temple prostitution in ancient Israel. And Mm -hmm. I see that you're writing a book on ISIS. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Super excited to see what comes from that because we do need to be able to see beyond just the woman serving in the temple and priestess being associated with sex. Mm -hmm. They did so much more than that. Um, Exactly. But that's all they've been relegated to in our history books. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Mm. So, so much, yeah, they, what I've been learning recently is how the women, they, they believed that the snakes were the, the holders of wisdom. Mm-hmm. And the women in the goddess temples, there was usually an area where the snakes, like a snake pit, and the goddesses used to listen to the snakes. They also used to, the goddesses, sorry, the priestesses mm-hmm. used to inject um, snake venom into their arm, into their veins, so that they could have a hallucinogenic experience and tap into vision and prophecy. Sure. And so then I, I 
got to see how all that was completely twisted in the Adam and Eve story. So here we have Eve, who represents a priestess in service to the goddess, and we've got the snake, who's then Talking set up to be satanic and evil mm-hmm. and, and whispering manipulative things in Eve's ear that are going to tempt her into sin and which is going to bring down the whole of, uh, you know, the male spiritual um, elevated state. So, and then the, the tree, I learned that the tree is probably was not an apple tree. It's so interesting to me that we, that's how we've learned it, that it was an apple <laughs> the fruit that they picked. And actually when they were discovered and had to cover themselves, so, felt they had to cover their genitals up, they covered their genitals with fig leaves. And I'm thinking, hmm. So they're eating an apple, but they're covering some, themselves up with fig leaves. What? A what? Is there a fig tree and a fig tree in the Garden of Eden? And I, I could never figure that out, but then it became clear that the, the tree in the goddess temples was a sycamore fig tree. So mm. highly likely that the apple was not an apple, but a fig. And the, the fig was seen as the goddess's uh, flesh and fluid. So people would Uh eat the figs in the goddess's temple and know that they were communing with the goddess's body, her flesh and her fluid. Isn't that beautiful? And then that got taken over as the blood and the body. The communion, the Eucharist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's always just so much more whole and complete when we integrate the divine feminine side of things, which I think is the whole crux of a lot of your work is that when we cut out the, the feminine side of things, Mm-hmm. You miss out on so much power, the power of the, of the divine, the creative life force. I love how in your book, you also kind of redo Genesis 1-2, you know, of like the spirit of God moving over the face of the waters. And mm-hmm. for me, thinking about that in a maternal rather than a patriarchal stance totally changes the vision. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, Mary and... Marina and Marianne, all of those names come from the word sea. So the, the birthing waters of the goddess, that was an important aspect of creation, the creative impulse, yes. We can't, can't have birth just from a sky god. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how hard they tried, though. They tried really hard to make that the, the thing. Uh-huh. Uh, oh. I read in um, a book by Barbara Walker. She's, oh, she's one of my absolute heroines. She's written so much to dispel the mythology from the patriarchy. But uh, one of the things she said was that, um, that when, so men were really jealous of women. The je- women, women bled every month and men understood that if you bleed, you die. But mm-hmm. women could bleed every month and not die. So mm-hmm. uh, men understood that women were magical creatures and they, they didn't like it that women women uh, passed on their property and their land to their, their daughters. They didn't like it. The women were the only ancestors that we could really be sure about because no one understood then, of course, that men, men um, right. put the seed in the woman's womb. So, yeah. so men wanted the power and they decided to make it up that they were the birth givers. And the priestesses of old thought, but that's stupid. Everyone knows that women give birth. Everyone knows men don't give birth. No one's ever going to le- believe that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's completely unnatural. And, and but it just shows the power of conditioning and the power of a story repeated and repeated and repeated through the generations that eventually one starts to believe it, whether it's true or not, whether it appeals to reason or not. All right. We believe it because we've been told it so many times that it must be true. And that's, to me, that's, you know, that's how, that's how we are conditioned into anything. We just hear it often enough that we think it must be true and we start to believe it. Mm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very busy exposing all that mythology and, and so delighted to be able to do it. And that I'm, I feel freer and freer the more I learn and the more I study and understand about how the truth has been covered up by this patriarchal desire to have control. And I am cheering you on every step of the way. Thank you. <laughs> so, as we wrap up... Would you mind describing how do you see feminism? It's such a huge term that has been so misused and misaligned. Mm-hmm. How, do you, how do you see it and how is it working within your spirituality now? Well, when I was a feminist, this is another long story, but I'll try to make it quick. <laughs> um, when I was a feminist, I was really angry. I really was so angry. All my, and I understand now women have been angry for 5,000 years ever since the, the goddess religions were 
were wiped out by the invading Indo-European. Right. I didn't know that then. I just knew I was angry and I hated men and I wanted them all to be castrated <laughs> because I saw them all as potential rapists. So I mm. thought that was the answer to all peace at that time. So very angry. And I don't regret that phase. I had to go through it, but it wasn't really a powerful phase. I didn't really achieve anything except I burnt up on, on hatred. And so I understand feminism is, is, is the fight. It's the battle to, to gain equal status with men in our society. And it, it has been a fight. And it relates to what we were saying earlier about when you're fighting against something, you don't have power. Mm-hmm. So for me, setting my intention to embody and embrace the divine feminine is, is a more powerful way for me to move forward. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a place for feminists. I think that the women who are articulate and educated and who can fight in the legal system and fight in the political system to get women's rights established, there's definitely a place for that. And I'm, and I'm cheering them on because that mm-hmm. has to happen. It's just not how I, I'm going to be doing it. That's not my area of strength or genius. So what I can do is pray and write and vision. That's where I'm strong. So that's how I see myself moving forward, still a feminist, but focusing on this changing at the, at the cellular level, changing at the, at the level of thought in order to change the social structure that I've been raised in. Oh, thank you for sharing. That is so meaningful to me as a mother I'm raising. My daughters are now 14 and 12, and um, we had a conversation in the car the other day, and the word feminist came up, and my partner offered that. He felt like most people still think of it in the very militant sense, and man-hating, and my mm. younger daughters who are you know now exposed to like fourth and fifth wave feminism were instantly defensive and thought, what? I, that did not ever occur to them. And And um, I was partially pleased in that moment that for them, it has been more about taking pride in being female and feeling equal Mm -hmm. to men Mm -hmm. and the ability to serve their sole purpose, however that comes about as well. So I think the Mm -hmm. work that you and your sisters have done to vision for the next generations is already taking seed and it's beautiful to watch. Mm, I wanted to give you a compliment because your daughters are a direct result of being around you and noticing how you uh, manage that relationship with, with men in, in, you know, your partner and men mm. in the world, how you are serving and wanting to be embracing rather than fighting against. So that they've picked that up from you, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, for me, it's more of a sovereign thing, you know, a, a mm. grounded assuredness. When a woman truly knows who she is, there's, mm. the ego doesn't have to react. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a space of just being, which is funny because when I was writing my uh, master's portfolio for counseling to become a licensed therapist, we had to write this like 80 page document of how we saw the human psyche developing and when it goes wrong and what makes it go right and how to heal it. And when I finished and was having to defend it, I had a one of the chairs on my committee said, Tamara, you haven't, we've noticed you didn't cite any feminist psychology articles in your paper and I looked at them stunned jaw (laughs) little gobsmacked went I didn't know I was a feminist (laughs) it didn't it hadn't Mm -hmm. occurred to me because in my household growing up it was a four-letter word in conservative Christianity so it's just Mm -hmm. been an interesting experience too I had to go back and then read some feminist psychology I didn't know it was a thing (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. and realizing oh yeah I guess I can see a vein of that in there paying attention to the systems and how does it affect a person if they grew up in you know institutionalism and poverty or racism or sexual identity issues. Um, Mm -hmm. So it is now a beautiful cathartic experience for me to chat with you and then also look to the next generation and my daughters and just see her story coming back around. Mm -hmm. Mm. What a blessing to have a mother like you. Mm. (laughs) And what a Mm. blessing to have uh, soul sisters like you who are reaching out and giving back and showing us how we can expand our vision. Thank you, Tamara. It's such a joy to speak to you. I feel like we could go on all night. but we yeah, no, We'll have to start another whole series. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, too. Thanks for 
listening to the Sacred Psychology Podcast. I pray you found some inspiration and empowerment to go out and make this life the most fulfilling possible. You can follow Sacred Psychology on Facebook and YouTube. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Tag us on social media and let us know what you think as well. Please note that the information provided is not meant to convey professional, psychological, or medical advice. If you could use such services, I highly recommend seeking them out from someone you trust. To get in touch with me personally or to see how we might work together, please check out ariatherapy.com or talesfromatrapezoid.com. Until next time, everyone.